The Mariana Trench is a place you have to dive nearly 36,000 feet deep to reach. That's where the Challenger Deep is located, the deepest point on our planet. The pressure down there is just insane. The massive weight of all that water above pushes down so hard that it exceeds 1,000 bar. To put it in perspective, imagine a hundred elephants standing on a person's head. So yeah, not exactly the coziest place for research. And if you throw in the endless darkness, the Challenger Deep gets even less inviting. Still, people have been there many times. One of the most recent visits was made by the Chinese. Without a doubt, it's really important that during their deep sea mission, they discovered tons of new biological species and generally explored what it's like down at such extreme depths. However, China clearly had more than just science in mind. The three crew members who descended into the abyss managed to find something that could help the country avoid a resource crisis. So what did they find? Let's dive right in. China ranks first in the world in battery production, electric cars, and green energy. However, the country is already facing issues with the resources it needs to stay on top in the global race. For example, China confidently declares, by 2060, we'll become a carbon-neutral country. And it's steadily moving in that direction. Wind turbines and solar panels are spreading all over the country, and natural gas is actively used to shift away from coal power plants to something greener. And that's where China's running into some problems. In 2025, domestic consumption is expected to grow by 6.5% and reach 16 trillion cubic feet, while local production will barely exceed 9 trillion cubic feet. That's a yearly gap of almost 7 trillion cubic feet, which Beijing has to cover through imports by pipeline and by sea in the form of liquefied natural gas, or LNG. At the same time, LNG delivery started dropping in 2025. Tankers are bringing in 22% less gas compared to last year, pushing China to negotiate with new exporters and book ships in advance. Any delay in delivery instantly affects market prices and adds pressure on green energy and industry. China is also increasingly running into a cobalt shortage, a key element for EV batteries and stationary energy storage systems. Almost 98-99% of its imported cobalt intermediates come from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But in 2025, a three-month export ban was in place there, which sharply pushed prices up by 40 to 50 percent and exposed the risks of monopoly dependence. Nickel's a problem for Beijing, too. While China ranks among the top global producers of goods made of nickel, which is just as crucial for battery making, the country's badly lacking in the ore itself. Due to the uneven distribution of deposits, most of the nickel has to be imported, which makes China vulnerable to global price swings and political risks in supplier countries. According to researchers, China's reliance on imported nickel ore keeps growing, while the supply-demand balance stays constantly in the negative. The copper crisis is creeping up on China, too. In May 2025, smelters received a record high of almost 3 million tons of copper concentrate, but even that's barely enough to cool price tensions and keep the furnaces running. A shortage of ore has thrown the market into a perfect storm. Negative treatment charges and fierce competition among processors for every pound of raw material. Without a stable supply, copper for chips and wiring could end up in short supply. Apart from essential metals, China also dominates in processing heavy rare earth elements like dysprosium and terbium. But the drawn-out conflict in northern Myanmar has already shut down mining around Bamo, a key logistics hub. Imports of rare earths into China dropped by half in early 2025, threatening the production of magnets for electronics. But China wouldn't be China if it didn't come up with a fix for all these problems. And this one might surprise a lot of people, because the country is seriously getting ready to tap resources from the ocean floor. We're heading to the Mariana Trench. In 2020, China dove down there using the manned deep-sea submersible Fenduze. This is the deepest dive ever for China and one of the deepest in world history. Still, the mission wasn't just about setting a couple of records. The sub had gear on board to measure temperature, pressure, salinity, and other environmental conditions at extreme depths. During the mission, scientists discovered animals new to science that live in extreme conditions and collected samples of rocks, seabed sediments, and water for geological and chemical analysis. What does the Chinese resource shortage have to do with this? First off, it's important to note that the depths of seas and oceans, including the Mariana Trench, are places where, under incredible pressure and low temperatures, methane gas leaking from the Earth's crust gets trapped inside a crystalline water structure. The result is an ice-like substance called methane hydrate, clathrate, or if you want to sound fancy, fire ice. One of the amazing properties of fire ice is its energy capacity. 
Just 0.04 cubic feet of the liquefied substance breaks down into about 6 cubic feet of gas ready to burn or be further processed. This makes methane hydrate more cost-effective compared to traditional LNG. Perfect for China with its energy problems, right? From the standpoint of carbon balance, methane hydrate is a clean hydrocarbon. When burned, it releases about half as much CO2 as coal and leaves almost no ash. This makes fire ice a top priority for countries aiming to cut emissions and switch to cleaner fuels. China, with its goal of carbon neutrality by 2060, is on board. Another key discovery is polymetallic nodules, which are round formations ranging in size from 0.2 inches up to 6 inches. They may look like potatoes or pebbles, but if you take a closer look, they're made up of thin layers of various metals and minerals stuck around a core. How did they end up scattered across the seabed as separate objects? Well, that's a long process, but we'll explain it now. The core, like the tooth of some underwater creature, falls to the seabed, after which metals start sticking to it. Each new microlayer forms on the core incredibly slowly, just 0.08 to 0.4 inches per million years, so large formations can be tens of millions of years old. This slow growth rate makes them true fossil artifacts of the ocean floor. Of course, this is important for researchers, but humanity is interested in something else. The metals and minerals that are really needed nowadays stick to the core. On average, each ton of polymetallic nodules holds around 35 pounds of nickel, 19 pounds of copper, and 13 pounds of cobalt, plus a ton of other useful resources like rare earth elements and manganese, with as much as 881 pounds of the latter. At the same time, scientists agree that on the ocean floor, including the Mariana Trench, there are 300 billion tons of these nodules. So for China, this is literally a way out from resource shortages, just lying at the bottom waiting to be picked up. And here's exactly the problem. You can't just pick up fire ice or polymetallic nodules. They're found at incredible depths, where the pressure is insane, and it's generally not comfortable for anyone but the local inhabitants. But hey, we're talking about China, remember? This country's already making big moves in exploring the depths of seas and oceans. To begin with, China's actively developing a whole range of autonomous underwater vehicles that help the country carry out large-scale deep-sea research and map ocean floor resources. Some of the best known in this lineup are the Xianlong series and the deep-diving Haiyi gliders. Xianlong 2 marked a major milestone in the history of China's deep-sea exploration. This vehicle can dive as deep as 14,700 feet. And it's equipped with thermal imaging for spotting hydrothermal anomalies, a laser scanner, underwater photography tools, and a magnetometer. It went through its first test in 2014 in a freshwater lake and then completed 15 dives down to 14,580 feet, working continuously for up to 31 hours, proving the reliability and stability of all its systems and ushering in a new era for the practical use of deep sea drones in China. Built on the base of the Xianlong 2, the Xianlong 3 came out with more homegrown parts like nav sensors, computing units, and cameras. Pushed its autonomous time past 40 hours and got more energy efficient. Thanks to its fish-like design and smart autopiloting tech, it pulled off a 96-mile underwater trip at depths of up to 12,600 feet, setting a national distance record for this kind of unmanned vehicle. But hold on, which one of these unmanned vehicles is actually going to make it to the bottom of the Mariana Trench? There's no way they can be out there hunting for resources in the deepest parts of our planet. Still, in 2020, the Chinese tested a new Xianlong series unmanned vehicle that can already dive to a depth of 19,600 feet. And even at that depth, it handled every task without any direct human input. The operator just sat back on shore and watched everything through the cameras. As for the Hai Yi series, these are deep-sea gliders that can carry out long-term observation missions while using very little power. In 2017, the Hai 7000 set a world record for gliders diving to 20,700 feet in the Mariana Trench, collecting valuable data on hydrological conditions and proving its watertight design and resistance to extreme pressure. Of course, the Chinese aren't just doing reconnaissance. The country is also moving forward with autonomous deep-sea mining. They're developing drones that can operate at ultra-deep depths. One vivid example is the Kaito-2 project developed by researchers at Shanghai Tech University. In July 2024, its engineering prototype dove to a depth of 13,450 feet for the first time and successfully retrieved polymetallic nodules rich in copper, cobalt, nickel, and manganese. At the same time, Kaito-2 showed off unprecedented agility, 
By automatically adjusting to steep seamount slopes, sticky seabed sediments, and shifting terrain, it paved the way for full-scale mining of deep-sea mineral deposits. Cato 2's technical achievements include six national records from diving depth to introducing multi-mineral drilling and collection technologies, as well as smart route planning with incredible precision and a metal-free cable system for reliable hoisting and lowering. Its autonomous terrain sensing and self-adjusting movement system have been the key to safe navigation across the complex geological landscapes of the ocean floor. At the same time, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation developed a unique manipulator for deep-sea remotely operated vehicles called the Qilin Arm. This flexible mechanical arm, weighing just 132 pounds, comes with seven functions, stretching, contracting, rotating, gripping, pulling, pushing, and spinning, which lets it handle a wide range of tasks, from precisely locking a drill head in place to carefully retrieving sample containers. The prototype successfully passed ground tests in Shenzhen and was put into operation, carrying out precise tasks during its first deployment in the Pearl River Delta Basin. However, everyone is clearly waiting for the moment when the Chinese finally send down the robotic arm to pick up nodules at the stated depth of 23,000 feet. What's interesting is that a whole new base is now being set up specifically for fire ice, or as the Chinese call it, the Cold Seep Ecosystem Research Center. It's the world's first all-in-one land and sea platform designed to study the unique deep sea oasis on the ocean floor where methane, hydrogen sulfide, and CO2 seep out from cracks. The project officially kicked off on February 28, 2025 in Guangzhou, led by the South China Sea Institute of Oceanography at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and is expected to take five years to complete. The concept is based on three interconnected subsystems. First, the Deep Sea Lab. It's a mobile manned platform set 6,500 feet down, built to accommodate up to six researchers for up to 30 days while they carry out field work and experiments right in the cold seep zone. Secondly, the land-based counterpart, a series of chamber stands that accurately replicate the pressure, temperature, and chemical makeup of seabed sediments, which will let scientists model biogeochemical processes under controlled conditions. Thirdly, infrastructure support, communication, power supply, logistics, and data management systems that ensure continuous exchange of samples and information between the marine and land segments. The cutting-edge sample stand and sea land synergy model make scientists work more productive. They can switch on the fly between field and lab conditions, instantly tweak environmental settings, and watch how the ecosystem reacts. That's crucial to understanding how communities of methane and hydrogen sulfide-eating chemoautotrophs take shape, how gas hydrates change over time, and how all that affects the planet's carbon cycle. The Marine Lab's technical setup includes interfaces for deep-sea manned submersibles, a long cable communication system linked to the support vessel, an array of sensors for tracking pressure, temperature, and chemical makeup, and robotic arms for sampling. The land-based section is equipped with thermobaric chambers and reactors that recreate the chemical conditions of cold seeps and support the cultivation of chemoautotrophic communities. It's expected that in the third and fourth years of the project, extensive expedition studies will be conducted, deep-sea work involving seabed sample collection and live ecosystem monitoring, with land-based simulations running in parallel. The fifth year is dedicated to tying all subsystems together and opening the research facility for global collaboration. After going into operation, the experimental complex will lay the groundwork for extracting fire ice, polymetallic nodules, and other deep-sea resources, and will also help China shift from being a follower to a leader in deep-sea ecobiology and engineering. All in all, you could say things are going great for China. Very soon, it's kicking off large-scale extraction of all seabed materials to save itself from a resource shortage. Thing is, what might be a lifeline for the country could be a catastrophe for everything living on the seafloor. For instance, the machines used to collect nodules strip off the top layer of sediment, which means a loss of shelter and food sources for many deep-sea invertebrates. When excavators and rippers are at work, they kick up huge plumes of suspended particles that can spread for hundreds of miles from the mining site. These sediment clouds make the water murkier, which blocks filtration in many sponges, corals, and bivalves, leading to their suffocation and cutting off the food supply all the way up the food chain. Besides that, mining machines create noise and vibrations in the silence of the abyssal zones. Since many deep-sea species use sound signals to navigate and communicate, the constant background hum of the machines can cause them stress, disorientation, and disrupt their usual behavior in feeding and breeding. During the lifting and initial processing of nodules on board ships, 
extra plumes of tailings form, containing fine particles and potentially toxic metals like lead or cadmium. Dumping these into the water column can poison plankton and small crustaceans, passing heavy metals up the food chain to bigger predators and creating risks for the whole ecosystem. The consequences for this carbon cycle cause particular concern. Deep sea sediments hold trillions of tons of organic carbon built up over millions of years. Disturbing and carrying away these deposits during extraction can release some of the stored carbon, weakening the biological pump that helps the ocean absorb CO2 from the atmosphere and regulates the planet's climate system. The saddest part is that restoring abyssal ecosystems after mining is practically impossible on a human timescale. The growth of new concretions takes millions of years and the reproduction and colonization of organisms on bare seafloor happen very slowly due to low population densities and cold temperatures. Studies from the 1970s and 80s showed that the traces of mining remain visible and barely recover even decades later. You think the situation is better with fire ice? Absolutely not. Extracting methane hydrate comes with a whole bunch of environmental risks. First off, artificially breaking up the hydrate layer weakens the sediments, which can trigger underwater landslides and slope collapses. Similar events have already been linked to shelf collapses off the coasts of Norway and the U.S., as well as risks of tsunamis and earthquakes in coastal areas. Secondly, because of local warming or shifts in the Earth's crust, fire ice can instantly release large amounts of methane, which probably won't sit well with both sea creatures and surface explorers. The third risk is chemical pollution. Suspended particles in the sediments lifted along with materials from the bottom may contain heavy metals and hydrogen sulfide. Their entry into the bottom environment and water column threatens benthic organisms and filter-feeding invertebrates, disrupting the food chains. Finally, extracting fire ice might disrupt how the ocean works as a biological filter. Emissions of organic matter and methane from disturbing the bottom sediments cut down the ocean's capacity to soak up CO2, weakening one of the most important climate control systems. So if China decides to go for large-scale resource extraction, both from the Mariana Trench and from a more accessible part of the ocean, it'll need to focus on minimizing the impact on the seabed ecosystems, as well as keep constant tabs on the health of all marine life. Otherwise, pretty soon the country will have to do what humanity always ends up doing, undoing the harm it caused to the environment.